welcome to Take Me to the Cloud. I'm Kim Gordon, and I'm here with my colleagues Walter Merkus and Joe Ritchie. Hi, everyone. This is Joe. Hey, thanks for coming in and uh, listening today. Uh, we're pretty excited to share, you know, some of our experience and knowledge on this topic. Um, you know, this group here is in our Witham advisory practice, and we focus on helping companies basically solve problems. But uh, specifically, we're going to talk about solving those problems with a Take Me to a Cloud series. Thanks, Joe. Uh, this podcast is going to occur on a monthly basis for around 30 minutes each. Um, Take it away, Wally. Sure. So <laughs> as we look at sort of the topics and areas, it's going to be important for us to look at uh, look at what types of topics we're going to discuss. And it's important to start with a definition of the cloud. And, you know, Joe, you and I will banter back and forth and Kim will have this whole discussion around what the definition of cloud and it means many things to many people. For some, it simply means a place where we can store our software or access our software. Hey, Joe, you were talking about an op model before. Can you just run through that a little bit? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I mean, um, th the way I've seen it with our clients is the cloud is basically an operating model. It's a mindset, okay? It it's a different way to run your company. And when you think about it, yes, there's, there's, there's a lot of research out there about the cost effectiveness. I don't think there's any deniability about that. It can be 30 to 60% based on research reports I've read in the last couple of years in terms of cost efficiency, but that just sets the table, right? To us now operating in the cloud, right? There are four pillars, right? That I see that are really important. And even more so today, and how we're all rethinking how business has to get done in you know the lockdown world. And those pillars are: I need to work remote. Okay, I still need to collaborate with my my colleagues, with my clients, with my suppliers, my vendors. Right. Um, I still need to be secure. I think cybersecurity is on steroids here when you're working in the cloud, clearly because how much money the software companies spend on security compared to you in your own companies. It really pales in comparison. And the last pillar here is productivity, right? So I really started about the cost efficiency, but again, productivity, as I'm working in the cloud, helps me to think about two words. Those two words are modernization and innovation. So in case you're taking those, I'll go through those pillars one more time. Remote, secure, collaborate, and productivity. And all of that should help us lead towards modernization and innovation. I think, Wally, that's what you and I were talking about. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You know, traditionally... Um, Kim and I are working on a CRM engagement right now where this customer is, is using modern tools and modern solutions, but they're really not getting the benefits of the cloud. And we're trying to work through a couple of the things and a couple of the ways that we're going to help this customer, which is really the topic of today. But, you know, before we get to there, you know, talking a little bit more about the benefits and to, to, to me when I'm in there working and, if, and Kim, if you think of this particular customer, it's the speed and time to market to value. And I think that is one of the biggest things, you know, traditionally in the old days, you would have had to go through, uh, you know, build, get your servers up and running, get the software loaded, et cetera. Um, and now it's simply uh, you're up and running and now you're starting to configure in a very short period of time. Um, you know, so Kim, I don't know what you think about this CRM project we're on. Maybe talk a little bit about some of the questions and the and the way you went about that exercise of assessing uh, for the CRM. Sure, Wally. 
Um, essentially, this project actually initially started as a ERP implementation. So we're focusing on AR, AP, GL inventory. And then this eventually evolved to realizing that they need more of the CRM piece to add on to it. So they needed a more holistic um, approach to their business because what they were doing, they were still operating in their ERP system, but still tracking their sales activities on the side. And that was a huge part of their business that they needed streamlined in order to make a better customer experience for them on the front lines and not just the back office operations. So one of the benefits that they were looking for is not only how can we just translate this Excel spreadsheet into an ERP exactly the same way they structured it, but also how to optimize each and every piece of the process, how they um, look at data, how they think about data, they need to restructure their whole sales model now. So a CRM or any other implementation or assessment has to keep in mind not where they are right now, but also where they need to be in the future. Really like that. I like the way you went about that because I think that's exactly right. When we walked in the door with this particular client, what we noticed is that there wasn't really a cloud strategy and it was more of a, we would like access, we would like to have new software, we would like to modernize their solutions, but we don't know where we're going. And some of what you just talked about, I think is very relevant, working on getting yourselves ready as an organization, defining what readiness is. So we we here at Witham will do a lot of, uh, spend a lot of time in that cloud readiness time. And we're spending a lot of time defining your strategy. We believe that all of these things are much a people problem on a people issue more than it is a technology problem. You know, Joe, you and I talk about this a fair amount as we banter back and forth on our on, on the practice and wh where we're going with the practice. A lot of times we're not solving or we are solving for technology, but most of the time we're dealing with with people and people challenges and things like that. Could you just give a brief talk about a brief sort of note around change and and how companies think about organizational readiness? Yeah, I, I, I think you're spot on there, quite frankly. Uh, people is that dynamic, right, where there's no secret sauce and everybody, you know, we, our, our life is great. We get to meet so many different people and learn about how people learn and their styles, okay? And if, if I think about the benefits, Wally, talent, right? We've always said in our practice that talent wins the day. If you have the right talent working with you, you can figure out almost any problem, okay? And so with the cloud, right? If you think about today, you might be constrained with your talent. Now you might be shaking your head and say, hey, look, you know, there are many people unemployed. True, right? But the cloud's technology has been an evolution. How many folks, professionals, have really kept up with the evolution, right? with their skills. Now, we know the universities that we hire from, um, you know, have great programs in place to teach younger professionals cloud software and technology, right? Though, what about your own companies? What have you done really to elevate people, all right? Because they're, they're talent. There's a reason they're still with you today. So from a change management perspective, learning and development is the first key aspect that I'll talk about there, right? And so as we think about moving to the cloud, we got to think about our people, okay? They're going to go through a transformation. For some, it's going to be okay. For some, they're going to struggle. And some, they're going to say, absolutely not, okay? Um, and so our, that change management program on learning and development really needs to pay attention to that. But again, bringing this all back to Wally's point, this is more of a people problem, right, to solve for. And luckily for us, we've had that success in our change management, and I call it really user adoption, because that's what it's meant to be, to help companies get the benefits of going to the cloud, right? Yeah. I think that's what you were referring to, Wally. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I think, you know, as we start to complete our assessments and our and our cloud readiness, uh, you know, I, I look at sort of what the business case and what the benefits are, because you still have to consider that. So a lot of times people might be trying to modernize for the right for the wrong reasons and they, they're modern. They're under resourcing some of these projects so that they're not thinking of the people side of these projects.
very important to make sure that you're, as if you're going to the cloud, that you understand, first of all, what you're going to go to the cloud with, how much of that software you're going to go to the cloud with, and where you're going to be ready. And is your organization ready? Are you ready to embark on that cloud transformation, uh, digital proof of concept, use case, whatever it is that you're trying to solve for as you go through your journey to the cloud? Um, you know, Kim, we talked a little bit about um, approaches and how how we might get a, how we might adopt it, adopt cloud. We talked a little bit. Joe talked a little bit about change. Project management is a significant aspect here as you go through some of these things. And I know you you've been you and I have been on a few projects here where you're managing those projects. Could you just talk a little bit about some of the things that you're finding when we go through these projects that are relevant to going to the cloud? Sure, thanks Wally. So essentially when people first view an implementation project, they're thinking it's purely technology and to Wally and Joe's point, there is a huge people element that sometimes is the biggest risk in making sure you have a successful deployment as well as, as a successful operational future in operating this. So there needs to be internal ownership by, by the, the company adopting the technology. And then during the project, both sides, whoever is helping you implement it and the company itself need to unite from the project management perspective to make sure that to mitigate all the people risk involved as well as other risks. So, for example, um, there if you have a client that is um, it is tackling on all these customizations um, and it's not just utilizing native functionality, you might need a whole PM team to manage on both sides to manage the entire project. So it's also PM is is seen as almost dispensable in a way, but that's a misconception because that's that guarantees how how the change management is going to be effectively deployed in the future, and it can't be underestimated. Um, so it could either be a team, it could be two individuals, but that's how you manage the project and beyond itself. Yeah, I really like that. I like that a lot. You know, if we were to to think about how we're assessing and how we look at cloud readiness when we go in, we the first thing we look at is sort of the cloud adoption area. And then we look at the benefits and make sure the business case is there. Cybersecurity, which Joe alluded to uh, just you know earlier. And then also the physical security and disaster resiliency is very important. How quickly, if you go down, can you get your information? We're shocked when we walk into some places and they haven't thought through resiliency because the cloud company says, oh, we take care of disaster recovery. Well, we've got it all. And then no one's actually done a disaster recovery test. And if something were to go down, they haven't actually validated and done it. Now, traditionally, a lot of people spend a lot of, a lot of companies spend a lot of time on disaster recovery and, and, or, and figuring out what that organization's like. So for us, when we tie all those things together, we call that a maturity and we build a really rank companies in a maturity model so that we can understand and help them deal with the risks and build a roadmap uh, for them for cloud adoption. Hey, Joe, just, I'm just thinking about when we build out our statement of work and we always put the objectives of a project in the statement of work. And, and sometimes what happens is you get halfway through a project and sometimes you get lost in the detail. And we always seem to want to go back to those objectives of the project. I think, uh, I think you, your uh, uh, interpretation of this is really, really excellent. And I thought maybe you could just speak a little bit to why objectives uh, are so important in a project. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's one of my pet peeves, right? Because we represent ourselves to people that we work with to be very practical business people, right? While you've owned your own company, I've worked in private industry for many years before I came into public consulting. And I think it really matters to have a practicality mindset, right? And, you know, there are sometimes we've, we've even told our clients, don't spend the money. And they take a step back or raise their eyebrows and say, well, wait a minute, you, you don't want work? No, we want to do the right work, right? And the right work is to say, what are we here to solve? Okay. Now, I know this might sound to you in the audience to be very basic, but some folks that we've met who want to take me to the cloud, their thought process is, and you might have heard this phrase in the industry called rip and replace. Now, that's a management decision, but I don't think they avail themselves of modernization. Now, wait a minute. So I've said modernization, and so is Wally, maybe five, six times. So let me help put this together. 
modernization for us, right, is being able to work remote, re, uh, be secure about it, still collaborate, and gain efficiencies through productivity. That's modernization, okay? And therefore, when I look at objectives, I want, we really want them to be tangible. What is it that we're going to change, right, and why? So, you know, it could be the business plan. It could be a vision, right? And, and sometimes it's just not a complete software implementation. It might just be a piece inside the software that you want to change, right? So don't think this is really big and it's not meant for you. No, it can be. It might just be a process change. Here, we're just talking about, you know, using the efficiencies of cloud. But those objectives really are going to also be used for change management. Because any leader that we work with would say to me, Joe, why am I spending this money? What's my ROI? And maybe you might think, well, there is no ROI in technology. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes, you know, to be more modern and, and operate is a necessity with you and your customers, right? But those objectives, if they're outlined carefully and with some tangible targets, we've used those on projects as we go through a project and even stop the project to say, well, wait a minute, how are we going to get to this, this key metric? And we might have to rethink the strategy. Okay, so that's why to us, what are we all working towards? It's just not about putting in a new ERP or a new CRM. We have to get something back from it. To build on that, Joe, that's why we go in initially and try to seek first to understand what the company is doing, how they specifically have their operating model, and we perform an assessment and observe what they're doing day to day in order to determine what the next steps are and if you really need to get to that point, or is it just something um, little optimizations for what they already have. So there's flexibility with different solutions with what you have today, depending upon what your business needs are. You, yeah, you're right, a... Kim. I'm sorry, Wally, but you're right. You know, we use, I'll use the Wally phrase here, the sequence of events, right? In terms of, you know, no, if someone's listening, these folks are talking about spending lots of lots of money. No, that's not the case, okay? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is. But we much rather have a sequence of events. Wally, why don't you talk about that? Yeah, I think the sequence of events, depending on what you're trying to get to, um, you know, so if we tighten this up, we've got a company that we work with, say, just specifically on a revenue engagement. And so for them, it's more of a, these would be the necessary things you need to do to uh, to count your revenue. For other companies, they're actually looking for their first uh, foray into the cloud. And so in that instance, uh, some of our some of our uh, options for them would be, you know, these are the three cloud solutions essentially that would work for you. The sequence of events ties that together. It really is the secret sauce of the assessment. And the sequence of events is essentially what comes first, what comes second. This really is alignment. This really is about people. It has nothing to do with technology or software. It's almost a ruse. And, and, and in fact, when you look at our deliverables, they're very rudimentary, they're very simple bar graphs. You put this first, this goes second, this goes next. And, and we believe that that is the right way to go about doing it so that you can get your people aligned with what is first, what is second, what is third, and then move towards sort of uh, being successful with those types of, of cloud transformations or digital transformations. Very good. Yeah. I just want to pick up one more thing on the assessment, that, you know, and I think all of this is really about the assessment. So maybe what we could do is move through, you know, what we see, and I'll just sort of throw a few things around here. But, you know, typically for the assessments, you're coming in and you're either looking holistically at your IT, you're looking at ways to innovate, ways to make, you know, to build out your first digital use case. Maybe you're thinking of machine learning or beyond what we're talking about here on Take Me to the Cloud. You're thinking about these things and you're not sure how to innovate and get there. Or you're thinking just simply about, you know, operational excellence and how you can move through a journey to get to where you need to be. Hey, Kim, you know what we are doing, the, the, you know, the revenue engagement that we're currently on, you know, we're doing sort of a, a two day diagnostic, if you will, if I could use that. It's a very specific one. But, you know, as you think through what that assessment like the current state, future state, and then sort of how we're going to do it, 
maybe just talk a little bit about what we did as we were going through now, the analysis part, et cetera, just a little bit. Sure. So essentially, um, you know, a, a client came to us, they already had in mind specifically what they wanted to hone in on. So this is not a holistic request saying, hey, we want to figure out what's going on in each of our different departments and operations. They were very specific on their revenue. They wanted to streamline their billing as they bill same day. So it's very important to optimize their customer service as they keep scaling because to keep up with the load of billing, um, it was becoming a little burdensome for them. So essentially our process for the two day diagnostic was to really focus in on that key factor as well as any surrounding um, issues or operations that affected that. So people process technology data as well as whatever hands touched um, that process. And that includes um, sitting down in a overall boardroom, understanding from key executives, business owners, doing one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, process mapping, and you'll find at the end of all these different interviews with different levels and departments, everyone has a different perspective of what the ultimate process is. And between this department, that department, somewhere between there is the right answer. And then we're, we're trying to bridge the gaps between the company's understanding as well as our own to optimize. Okay. Yep. Like it. And, you know, we affectionately here call it, you know, uh, customer journey. Joe and I often talk a little bit about the customer journey and how that works. You know, the customer journey to me is is a uh, well known in the marketing world, but in the technology world, we usually say fit gap analysis and we're going to go in and do an analysis and we're going to ultimately get to where you are. We love using the uh, customer journey model because it allows us to sort of identify the interactions between both a function. So imagine we could look at the interactions in a finance uh, uh, department, and then we could look at the interactions of that finance department outward, both to operations internal. So these internal customers are there, and then also the external customers. And so by focusing on the interactions and the little pieces of their day to day, you know, a day in the life of anyone's role, you're able to quickly and easily identify where uh, they are going to be, you know, need extra help, uh, need more software. Uh, need more people. And so to Kim's point earlier, uh, full process technology and data, you're able to identify all of those key areas and look at the interactions within those. Joe, I don't know if you want to add anything to the customer journey, but it is something we use as a technique uh, for our technology uh, assessment practice. Yeah, just two seconds on bragging rights here. Um, uh, you know, uh, Wally coined that phrase, right? Um, some five years ago, and it's been so relevant with our with our clients because at the end of the day, when all of our customers are satisfied or more than satisfied, don't all good things come from happy customers? Of course they do, right? All good things come from happy customers. So my internal customers, those are your employees, right? If they're happy with using tools that make their life better, right? And getting their job done and rethinking how they can get their job done differently, they're gonna be happy. And then our external customers, they're gonna be happy with the whole experience, right? Uh, in terms of how you've served them. So that's part of our success. When we focus on that customer journey and what Kim talked about early and how we do that in our workshops, we have revealed a lot for organizations. And in our mindset, even though you haven't engaged us for change management, we are already thinking about change management and user adoption when we do that customer journey process, just to see who's ready, who needs more help, who needs less help. So that's why it's vitally important, the customer journey approach. Yeah. And to to build off of that, I find often when customers come and say, hey, we just want you to take a look under the hood. Um, this is what we think is wrong and we just want confirmation so we know next steps. It's almost like they're seeking a validation. And then often what we find, there's some underlying issues they haven't even considered. So a big part of that is um, revealing information that wasn't even on their radar uh, for for anyone. Um, so that that's the most important part of change management is because they're, they're prepared to hear what they told us, but they're not prepared necessarily to hear what, what they didn't tell us. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. love that. Mm -hmm. the share the share a voice of the organization, and you know, you flatten the hierarchy when you do this exercise. And I think it's very important that you do that so that the people that are actually doing the work have that biggest voice in the in those meetings. We we look at all this so that we use this technique, but ultimately what this is getting us to is a a cloud readiness, a digital maturity, whatever way you want to look at maturity. Um, what we're looking at is, uh, you know, if Kim and I are in looking at folks when we when we were, you know, pre-pandemic in offices, you know, do do your people have two monitors? Um, you know, how do they use uh, Excel? Are they uh, advanced users, low-level users? So we're really looking at people from that way, and trying to assess as an organization your maturity levels and go through and 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 work to sort of gain what applications will be right for you and what approach. This all ties back to the sequence of events. So if we have a low tech company and, and no disrespect to any company that is in that, there are a lot that are in that space. How we can't very well offer you the most advanced solution and you should be putting in machine learning and AI right off the hop. So what we do is we always try to blend the with your realistic goals, your investment choices that you're planning to make, and then blend that in with your maturity model. So that ultimately we end up to Joe's point earlier about the cloud, an op model that will make the most sense for you as an organization. And I think my point is not to say more about how with them does it. My point is to say, if we never chat again, make sure you're thinking through your organization more holistically. We find companies go in and do these assessments in silo. The finance team will do a finance assessment. The inventory and ops team will do an inventory and ops assessment. And then they're not even talking to each other. Meanwhile, we all know that inventory ends up on the balance sheet. And when we procure inventory, it goes through a whole financial function as well as an ops function. And so these are entirely interconnected and interrelated processes, just as one example. But very important as you go through this exercise that you think these things through uh, as you get to a, an approach of, of your digital maturity and your cloud readiness piece. And I, th I think if companies are also ready to take the next step, it's important to realize that when you are looking for a certain type of assessment, make sure it's not one that th they're trying to conform a solution upon you, but trying to figure out what solution works best for you because there's, there's two different very approaches. So that's important why you need to, it's a very important to filter that criteria when you're selecting which vendor is best suited for you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. So we've talked a little bit about our assessments and how we go about doing them uh, without detail. And we're going to have future podcasts that are going to be specific about the tools, et cetera, that we use. Um, so we've really walked through. We do assessments. We do evaluations on software and risk assessments, et cetera. Um, you know, as we go into sort of um, other services that are in, involved in, in going to the cloud, you may choose to outsource and so it's not uncommon to have business process outsourcing and a whole model that changes the game. Joe, you're very familiar with this area and maybe you could just spend a, a little bit of time for those of the folks on this, on this uh, podcast that might be interested in outsourced models. Yeah, I'll bring it back to talent, right? And remember, when Wally started this conversation today on the podcast, we said this was a people challenge, not software and technology, right? Now, so when we get to meet with other companies, okay, and we're looking at talent and we're looking to understand efficiencies, learning and development, right, uh, consumption of new processes um, and modernization, innovation with the return on investment, right? So that was a lot, Joe. But when you put all that together, some companies have said, I don't think we're ever going to get there. OK. Um, and another reason we like the cloud is because the talent that exists in other places in the United States, OK, um, at software companies in terms of technology, right, the caring and feeding, there's still a server, OK, <laughs> there's still a server someplace. And I still need a chief information security officer, OK, to make sure I'm secure. And if you think about how much money you spend on that today, right, that talent is being consumed by the larger software companies and by business process outsourcing companies. Okay. So now you're, you're scrambling and you're scratching your head to find that talent. 
And, you know, we want to get those benefits. So to me, um, there is a path where you could transition yourself into a business process service model. Okay. Now, I didn't call it outsource for a reason. Okay. Because there are occasions where we, what we call is rebadge companies' employees. Okay. <laughs> Um, and we put them in a center uh, under Withams Business Process Services to support your account, right? But also other customers. Now your cost to serve your company has been lowered. You still have people who understand you, right? And in our Business Process Service Center, now we're we're kind of high tech here. Okay, I'm pretty proud of this because. Now we have other tools that help the financial close, okay, that monitor it very precisely for people to do their jobs. If we're going to process your accounts payable or collect your money on your invoices, now we have robotic process automation. So we have that software in our center. So now that's going to take the you know the redundancy at, at, of that task away from a person because now we want to use that person to do analysis. So my point here about business process services, we use more tools in that center that you might not be willing to invest in right now. And that all goes back to what? The productivity part in modernization, okay? I mean, there's also intelligent process automation so while I mentioned machine learning, right? And then we have artificial intelligence applications, right? So this can become very, very sophisticated. So you do have a path. So we just don't want people to still sit on the sidelines and don't do anything today because we really believe you have to rethink how you're going to get your business done in the world we operate. Maybe that's a little bit longer than you wanted, Wally, but I just wanted to draw the comparison of other tools in our center. No, I, I like it. I like it because I think, you know, as we look at subsequent podcasts, we're going to talk about products. We're going to talk about, you know, more detail around the assessments. And we'll even get back to talking more about business process um, services that that companies can offer um, and, and help people get to the cloud quicker. So mm -hmm. a lot of times that investment in people, which we've been really, you know, honing in on today is very important. So I'm going to turn it over to Kim. This has been a great first podcast, Kim and and Joe. I think it's it's good to have a banter around the types of things, the types of approaches. But I'm going to throw it back over to Kim to close us out for this first session. And and uh, thank you all for for listening in. Sure. Thanks for listening to us. Um, if you are interested in hearing a topic that we haven't covered, um, you can email us. There's going to be links in the description. Um, and you can visit our website with them.com to learn more about our services as well as the rest of our firm. You may find a holistic solution for you. That's all for now. Thanks folks. Bye everyone. Bye, Bye. everyone.